First of all, may I apologize that I'm speaking English, not Spanish. If I'd have known two years ago I was going to have a Spanish commissioner, <laughs> believe me, I'd be speaking Spanish now. Um, perhaps I can come back in two years and speak Spanish. First of all, could I congratulate Ms. Costa on this event? It's really, really good, and also the research that you do. It's really valuable. Um, and also, can I compliment Ms. Garcia on a, on a really terrific presentation? And I, I, re I take three things. I've just written down three things from what you said. Where we are is insufficient. But what we've done gives us enormous opportunities. But we need a vision as to where we're going to be. Let me fail miserably in answering that. Because let's talk a little today about the state of Europe's energy union. Let's take an honest look of where we are. Because we don't do that enough, I feel. We don't take an honest look of where we are. And let's ask ourselves where we wish to be and try and plot that course. Now, the European Union has worked enormously hard over the last 10, 15 years in order to try and address the three challenges of an energy policy, which should be the same anywhere in the world. Sustainability, competitiveness, and security of supply. The golden triangle, if you like. And let's have a look of what we've achieved, which gives two parts. What we have achieved, where we are, is the good part and the difficult part. But let's talk about the, the good part first. I think we've got a lot to be proud of in terms of where we've been or where we are now. We have our European energy policy based on our 2020-20 goals. Reducing CO2 by 20% compared to 1990, 20% renewable energy on, in our energy mix, and a 20% improvement in energy efficiency by 2020. Now, when we set these in, uh, in the year 2000, this was um, extraordinarily ambitious at the end of the day. But let's deconstruct what we've done. First of all, we have an emissions trading system mechanism. For all its faults, the best in the world, the gold standard. We have a renewable electricity directive for all its faults that will get us to 20% of renewable energy in the EU by 2020, and that has had the effect of catalyzing an industry, catalyzing huge investment globally in renewable energy, and bringing down the cost of wind and PV by 50%. We have, and I think this is, if there is anything that I would say is the biggest achievement, we have the gold standard of an energy efficiency policy globally. In the Commission, we have people from across the world on a weekly basis coming to study what we have done on standard setting, echo design, on buildings, on labeling, on cars, on action by member states. And this is delivering us a very long way to our 20% improvement in energy efficiency. We have the beginnings of an internal energy market. The third package is a huge achievement in terms of the rules on unbundling, on the creation of a European regulatory authority, on letting transmission system operators look wider than a single member state, in creating mechanisms for the creation of grid codes. We've come a long way in creating a common security strategy. And if you see the, res the, the response of the European Union in terms of stress tests and creating reverse flows following the Ukraine crisis, you realize it is quite an achievement. 
compared to where we were 10 years ago. We have been working together to diversify supplies. The construction of the Southern Corridor would not have happened if it was not for action at the European level. We have new rules which will catalyze the construction of the missing infrastructure that you mentioned. And we have created a common external voice. Now that's normally where people like me stop. But I said earlier we need to take a long, hard and honest look about where we are. And I would say we are not in the place we want to be. Europe's energy policy, at least to me, has not achieved, as yet, what we as Europe wish to do. So let's be honest. The emissions trading system is not delivering what we hoped it would do. It is not providing the incentives, the clear investment incentives to industry to invest in clean technology. At such a low emissions trading price, as Ms. Garcia said, we end up burning coal instead of gas and mothballing our brand new CCGTs. On renewables, there's a lot to be said for what we've done. And I have no doubt that the decision we took was right. But, as you said, let's look at the facts and ask us where we want to be. Today Europe is spending subsidies of between 60 and 100 billion euros a year on renewable energy. And we are, if you exclude large hydro, about a third of the way we wish to be in 2030. We all know we don't want to be in a place where Europe is spending 180 to 300 billion on subsidies in 2030. And we know we shall not be. But we have to make the decisions to ensure that we don't. Again, as you mentioned, we have the, what I call the olives in Finland problem. It makes as much sense, economically, to grow all the olives that Finnish people eat in greenhouses in Finland as it does to produce renewable energy in Europe where the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And we are losing, as you say, 30 to 40 billion euros in benefits from doing so. When we set out to do the 20%, we were convinced that Siemens would be building our PV panels in Europe. You're not. You failed us. <laughs> we don't do PV anymore. <laughs> we still have some manufacturing of the next generation of PV. But like many commodity products that PV now is, it is produced in China. In terms of competitiveness, and this is when I get upset, we're paying two to three times as much for our gas as the United States. Our industry is paying 50% or more for its energy than its competitors in the United States and in China. The average household in the European Union spends 5% of its disposable income on energy, higher, much higher than anywhere else, practically anywhere. We imported last year fossil fuels of the value of 400 billion euros, more than a billion today. It will be less this year with the oil price. And according to the International Energy Agency, today we have 31% of the global share in energy intensive trade. And by 2030, that will be reduced by one third. All that I have said from a European energy policy perspective is unacceptable. 
It's as the minister was talking about, it's talking about jobs and growth, the most fundamental things that we should be working for as the European Union. I talked about energy efficiency and I said it's the gold standard and we've made huge strides. We have. But think for a moment. We're convinced we will get a deal, a global deal on climate change. It's not possible to think otherwise. It's not possible to think otherwise. But any deal that we get that will really deal with climate change means that the European Union will have to reduce its CO2 by 80% or more by 2050. That means we've got 20% left to use of what we used in 1990. Well, half of that will be used to produce meat. And unless we stop eating meat, well, good luck with that one. And unless we stop producing NOx from industry, and unless we want to um, we find some other solution for airplanes, the only way you get to 80% cut is a zero carbon power industry, a zero carbon transport industry, and zero carbon homes, zero carbon buildings. We all know that investing in energy efficiency in buildings is probably the best thing that we can do with our savings at the moment. Gives you an 8, 10, 15% return on investment. Go to anybody in the street and offer them an investment package that will give them 8% guaranteed over the next 10 years, they'll take your hand off. But we are not succeeding in refurbishing our buildings, our houses. And this is about jobs and growth. If there is one thing that will produce jobs and growth in Europe, it's refurbishing our buildings. And we're not doing it. The internal energy market. If you see where we are compared to 10 years ago, it's an extraordinary achievement. But it's not complete. And what we are doing today will not complete it. If you mean by an internal energy union, an internal energy market, that a Spanish company in electricity or gas can sell in France with the same simplicity as if it were selling in Spain, or a Spanish company, a Spanish citizen, could buy from Electricité de France with the same simplicity as it would be doing from Endesa, then we are nowhere near there. We are making progress with the grid codes, with the development of common rules. But it is not as fast as it needs to be, and it is not as detailed as it needs to be. As I mentioned earlier, the investment signals to enable an electricity company to invest today are not there. We all know this. The regulated prices that we have for understandable, from a citizen's point of view, are distorting the market and preventing competition and causing tariff deficits in 11 countries. And this is leading us to develop capacity mechanisms. We have islands remaining in the European Union. And from the energy point of view, we are sitting in an island today. In terms of energy security, Many member states are, de are dependent on a single company for gas that views the supply relationship, shall we say, not only as a commercial issue. And our indigenous resources, as was mentioned earlier, our shale gas, we are not exploiting as perhaps we should if we really want to push gas prices down. I remember when I was at school and I once had a report card which read, tries very hard but does not always achieve the results to which he aspires. 
Perhaps our energy policy would get the same report card. Okay, so what are we going to do? Because if you take that balance, if you take the things that we've done, which are good, and you take the place where we wish to be, we are not going to get there. And that is why the heads of state have called for a European energy union. And to me, that European energy union recognises the need to take those difficult, courageous political decisions to set us on a path to achieve the objectives that I have talked about. So how will this work? Well, first of all, on the 25th of February, the Commission will adopt a strategy for achieving that. And those discussions are going on today, this week, next week. And so the input of this conference is extremely important in that respect, and the timing could not have been better. But let me outline the areas where the heads of state will be focusing on what to do. The first step is that we have, the heads of state have decided a strategy for 2030 in the light of Paris, in the light of the issues of competitiveness and energy security, not least in the light of the Ukraine crisis. And these objectives have now been fixed around which we must work. The first is a 40% reduction of CO2 by 2030, 27% renewables with an aim at 30%, and 30% energy efficiency, the renewable target being binding at the EU level, not at the national level. Now these targets deserve, I believe, our strong support. They are again ambitious. But if we believe in dealing with climate change, and we must, they are not an option. My colleagues dealing with the negotiations for Paris tell me that the commitments that the United States and China and the European Union are willing to do put us on a track for an increase in pre-industrial levels of temperature of about 3.5 degrees. So if we have the buy-in of many of the other countries in the world, perhaps we are not so far from the two degrees. I read yesterday in the New York Times that for the first time there is an overwhelming majority of American citizens who believe that climate change is man-made and climate change is personal. So that gives us great hope, I believe, for the future. So the question, therefore, the key question of the energy union is how to achieve these 2030 objectives in a way that will benefit EU citizens, that improves competitiveness, that reduces the cost of energy in our disposal income, and creates jobs and growth. Because if we do not succeed in developing an energy policy that turns these 2030 targets into better energy security, into more competitiveness, into lower energy bills, it will be counterproductive in its objective of incentivizing other people to do the same. So that is the key job that the heads of state wish to do. So let me finish by looking at the key issues that this energy union 
will address. First of all, energy security. As I said, too many member states remain dependent on a dominant supplier. We have to reduce the dependence of these countries and provide and push for vibrant liquid gas markets, gas hubs in all the parts of the energy union. We have to diversify our supplies in terms of Algeria, in terms of the Mediterranean, in terms of Asia, and complete the infrastructure necessary to bring the gas within the European Union to all parts of the Union. And one, hit one here, one has to focus, for example, on the issue of Spain, France, France, up upstairs to France, and then across. Mm -hmm. It's a key issue, it really is. We have to improve the competitiveness of our gas supplies. We have to get our gas price down. And we need a new partnership with many of our neighbours. In renewables, the President of the European Commission has said that he wants us to be the world leader in renewable energy. This does not mean that we want to have more installed capacity of renewable energy than anywhere else in the world. Because if you're arguing that, you'd be arguing that we don't want the rest of the world to deal with climate change. What we do mean is we want to be the hub, we want to be the centre of the next generation of renewable technologies. And we wish to be the manufacturing base of the next generation of renewable technologies. We will be looking in the Energy Union in terms of our research policy and our risk capital availability and how we can use the Juncker investment plan in order to catalyse this. The internal market needs a fundamental rethink in terms of its market design, in terms of its institutional structure, in terms of the way that the retail market works, in terms of consumer rights, in terms of the integration of renewable electricity in the market in a way that does not distort the market and provides <coughs> effective investment signals. And we need to rationalize and make use of the huge steps forward in technology in terms of smart meters, smart grids, <coughs> and the change in the topography of the grid that will result from the integration of the tsunami of locally produced renewable energy that we all believe will happen in the next decades. We will address the real challenge of energy efficiency of carbon-free buildings by 2050. And we need to find a new form of governance of the European Energy Union, balancing the right of member states to determine their energy mix, and that is in the treaty and will not be changed and cannot be changed and should not be changed but the need to work together coherently and intelligently to meet our common objectives. Albert Einstein once said, if you want to fix a problem, do not use the solution that got you into the problem in the first place. In many respects, that is something that we should take to our hearts when determining how to use and how to develop a European energy union. But it's only partially true. Because the foundations have been put in place for all their advantages and for all their disadvantages. I believe it's fair to say that Europe has the best energy foundations for a 2050 CO2 free society. But it needs a lot of work. And that is where the energy union needs to make that next step. And I think we all look forward to hearing the views of this conference over the next two days of how that needs to be shaped. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.